So many of you probably know that there are these things on YouTube called cringe compilations. I've enjoyed most of them, but there's one cringe compilation that I just can't get behind. Welcome to Toon Fever, baby. So, I want to talk about Whiplash. And Whiplash isn't so much a movie as it is a giant cringe festival. And it's not even about music or jazz or drums or anything as much as it's basically about a power struggle between a snot freshman music conservatory student with an ego the size of Taft and a buddy rich fetish who forces you to hate him throughout the movie and a top jazz instructor whose version of teaching rivals the kink of Fifty Shades of Grey with all of the shouting and none of the- So I really don't understand why this movie was so well received. I mean, it got such good ratings from seemingly everybody, and I know so many people who really, really like it. I remember when this movie first came out, um, you know, because I'm, I'm actually a jazz drummer. I played in high school and college. And so when this movie came out, everyone came to me and they're like, you need to see this movie. Like, you'll love it. It's about jazz. It's about drums. Like, it's perfect for you. And I was thinking, oh, how cool. A movie made about these things that I really, really enjoy. And when I saw the movie, I thought it was completely atrocious. The acting of Fletcher, the character, is interesting and rather good but it doesn't excuse the movie. I felt it was poorly written and basically constant cringe from pretty much beginning to end, and I'm not even overanalyzing. On like a face value cursory watch of this movie, so much popped out to me as odd or just wrong. I wanna say though, please do continue to like this movie and watch this movie if you want to. Just do consider that it's not so much of a movie as it is a cringe compilation. So I, um, I want to talk about cringe compilations just for a second. Some of you may not know what a cringe compilation is. Um, they're basically, usually people put together a YouTube video of a bunch of clips of different videos, all which will make you cringe because they are cringy or cringe worthy. These are some internet terms. And so I'd like to show you a few examples right now. I catch you, I'm gonna trust that you fall. Laura, do you trust me? Okay, let's do this. Are you ready? Here we go. When I say let's do it. Okay, Laura, let's do it! All right, right there. I got your attention. You put, you put the power of trust in yourself because you want to trust only you. She's okay. She's all right. She's fine. I've done this before. You guys, do me a favor. Very good! Very good! Yay! Anybody else want to share? Yes. seen this cringe compilation um, I just want to express that how you probably felt while watching those clips is very much akin to how I felt when I was watching the movie Whiplash so when I was going through this movie um, making a list of the things I thought I would like to comment about in this video what I found myself doing is basically filling pieces of paper like this um, with stuff and, you know, really, my list ended up looking more like the script uh, of the entire movie. And so I decided that I'm only going to go through a, mostly just the first half of the movie whenever I'm going through this. And I'm going to try to skip parts so it's literally, or so it's not literally me just reading the script of the movie. Um, but yeah, uh, it, it was tough for me to, to hold myself back from all the things I wanted to say because I didn't want to spoil the movie. <laughs> and one more thing that I'd like to say before we really get into the, the meat of this video is that I am very aware that this is a hot take. Um, I just don't understand why. So, <laughs> you know, comment down below. Let us have a conversation about this movie because I'm not of the opinion that if you like this movie, then you're stupid. That's not how I feel. I just feel personally that this movie 
isn't good. I really dislike it. So now let's get started. Okay, so the uh, movie opens up with a slow to fast single stroke drum roll uh, thing. And, and this is very much a thing. So, okay, nice gimmick. But it ends with a weird whoosh sound. Um, these things always end with a rim shot. So from a drummer's perspective who's heard this, this gimmick a lot of times, it was very unsatisfying to me. So we're starting off this movie cringing from the very beginning. Um, then we're going down a hallway, which is rather cinematic, I will say. But at the end of the hallway, you have the main character, Andrew Neiman, practicing playing drums. And they didn't even try at all to make it sound good. Um, it, sound, it kind of sounds like me the summer before my seventh grade year of school when I got my first drum set, um, back when I didn't know how to work the hi-hat pedal. And, and I was just mindlessly beating on the things you know, kind of like for hours. And, and I guess the idea is that this is a music conservatory student. Now he is a freshman, so that granted, but you got into a conservatory, which means that you probably have some skills and some passion. This dude's just mindlessly beating. Now I've heard people really complimenting this scene saying how good his drumming is and all this type of stuff. I don't think that is the case. I really think it sounds like mindless beating um, and I also think that they could have put in a little bit of effort to at least make the drums sound nice. It really does sound like me, summer before seventh grade, with my first drum set in the basement of my house. And it sounds like you're listening to that from upstairs. It just really sounds bad and boomy. And I'm not really seeing or hearing any effort here. So I'm not impressed. But then the professor walks in the room, Fletcher. And he does seem impressed. So I guess he disagrees with me. And now, the, the thing is, is, is what could you possibly be impressed with? He was literally just in a room pounding a bunch of baby baba goo goo gaga. If you're impressed with this, I don't believe you. So then what happens is they end up having a little conversational exchange. And then Andrew Neiman starts playing again. And he begins his next drumming tirade that he ends up going on with these random little like pitter patters on the bass drum that just sound really stupid and weird like he's shaking in his boots um except i don't think that's the point i think it just has no point it's really silly seeming if you see the movie listen for the random bass drum notes at the beginning of his next tirade it's really strange and then at the end of whenever he decides okay i've played enough to impress this guy he crashes the symbol and then he cuts off the symbol but that cutoff was so poorly edited and i just don't know why that's a good thing to do in a movie um like i don't know why people let stuff like that slide in a world where people complain about bad physics in movies and people complain about CGI that's not like the best of the best or just CGI in general, why do people get away with editing mistakes like this? So after he starts, after he stops playing, um, he basically says, let's see your rudiments. And then, and, you know, that's a little silly because in jazz, it's, it's, it's more of a style thing than a rudiment thing. Like if you're in a marching band or something, let's see some rudiments, sure. But in jazz band, I don't think I've ever heard this comment in my entire life in a jazz band setting. It, it is a little bit, it's a little bit weird. It seems a little bit poorly researched at that point, that, just that comment. And then the next thing that happens is he, Andrew Neiman is asked by the professor to perform a double time swing, which he decides to count off by clapping on beats one and three. And it is, well known to jazz players just in general that you would probably like the two and the four this is where the hi-hat lands on those things this is where the pulse is felt in a swing feel and so it is really silly to start this clapping on one and three it's the most uncharacteristically or it's it's the most uncharacteristic jazz thing it's just not a thing basically and and then he keeps saying faster faster and his drumming is just so spastic, like, no! and, and it's, um, it's just so weird. It, it's, it, I've seen a couple other people make this comment about this movie, it, is that you kind of see the beginning of this movie becoming a sports movie with this scene, the faster, faster, and just clapping and clapping, and, and it is very odd. You know, you, you kind of begin to see a theme here 
that this movie really isn't about music or jazz, and it hardly even pretends to be. So I want to talk a, a little bit more about this whole double time swing thing, because in this movie, it becomes such a big feature in the movie. And there's a um, pretty hilarious critique video of this part of the movie, this feature of the movie, this whole double time swing thing, because it really is kind of an overarching thing throughout the entire movie. Um, so, so there's a YouTube channel called Joe's Cra Joe Crabtree's Drum Lessons. That's a hilarious uh, video, uh, a satire piece, and I want to show it here. It's about 28 seconds long. So last night I went to see Whiplash and was truly inspired by the, the jazz playing in that. And uh, I thought I'd do a little bit of practice on my double time swing, which is such a key feature of the film. So here we go. This is how you want to start if you are working on your jazz chops. Five, six, and... <laughs> So if anything sums up how I feel about the movie, it's kind of this video. Um, in a way, the entire movie, especially towards the latter half, um, really, just like the whole movie feels that same sense of tension as he just showed in that clip. And I also want to say that that part that he just showed, that scene probably happens like five or six times in the movie. It is a very prominent feature and it's kind of disgusting every single time. So next, I want to bring up the um, Buddy Rich obsession that Andrew Neiman, the main character, has. This photo that I just showed, it's interesting because in the movie, when Andrew Neiman is just chilling in the practice room, he apparently taped or somehow stuck this picture that I just showed to the wall, and he'll just stare at it and it's really kind of weird um and, and you know i, I want to say the buddy rich association with this movie it does make sense because buddy rich is a drummer um and he's known for kind of being mean you know there are certain things called like the bus tapes where he yells at his players and is really aggressive and i think that that is reflected in the character of Fletcher, the band director. And so it makes sense, you know, Buddy Rich really, the, the I think was a huge inspiration for everything in the movie. And so it makes sense that this is, it's actually like an interesting detail, but it's not really believable at all. A, just because Buddy Rich is not the most relevant jazz drummer in the modern era. You know, you talk to anybody, they're going to have their favorite jazz drummer. And I mean, maybe somebody will say Buddy Rich, but it's probably not super likely. You know, there's there's a, a whole host of more maybe hip drummers to be into. Um, there's people who might be into the Nate Smith and the Mark Juliana or the J.D. Beck or the Larnell Lewis or probably... You know, like myself, I really like guys like Dave King and I really like Bill Stewart, but you're not going to find many young jazz drummers today referencing a whole lot of Buddy Rich unless they're playing in a big band and then they'll listen to some Buddy Rich just to kind of get that sound in their head. And I do, I own some Buddy Rich music that I really appreciate and I really like a lot and I respect his playing a lot and I think he's a very good um drummer and a ranger and a good band leader and, and so there's a lot to be respected about buddy rich and there is a lot about buddy rich that influences this movie in an interesting way but i think overall the obsession with buddy rich really is weird so some cringy scenes later with some with some pretty bad um drumming acting and instrument acting so, so yeah some scenes later um, basically, Andrew Neiman, the freshman, the squeaker, as he's affectionately called later, um, gets into the studio band, um, which is Fletcher himself's big band. Um, Fletcher basically comes into their audition room and makes them, uh, the, the drummer is in the room, the two of them, makes them kind of battle 
and I guess he was impressed with Andrew Neiman's double time swing. Uh, so, so he got to uh, find a spot in the band and he gets into the band and he gets told to show up at 6 a.m. And, and he wakes up late and he runs to practice room, um, which I guess is very relatable for the college students who have ever been late to an important class or something before. So it's not that, you know, that's fine. Makes sense. Um, I get it. I've done that before. Um, probably not to that extent. But uh, yeah, in, during him on his way to class at like 6.03 a.m., he falls and he bashes his face on the ground really hard, which I found just like, okay, that's really weird. Um, and you'd probably get a pretty gnarly bruise from that, but he doesn't really sustain any injury throughout the rest of the movie. So I don't exactly believe it. And okay, so he gets to the classroom. It's like a little after six. He's a bit late and no one's in the classroom. And, and then he goes outside of the room and he looks at the sign outside the doorway that says the practice starts at 9 a.m. So Fletcher basically lied to Andrew Neiman, I guess, as a means of toying with him or intimidating him or something. And honestly, it's just kind of stupid. It doesn't really make you mad at Fletcher. It doesn't really make you feel angry. It's just kind of like dorky. And so basically what Andrew Neiman decides to do is apparently he decides to sit in the practice room for about three hours and wait until nine o'clock's practice is going to start. And there's a scene towards the beginning of practice that I want to talk about. Basically about three minutes before class starts at 9 a.m., all the players walk in. And they walk in and they're holding their cases. And, you know, they walk straight to their seats holding their cases, which will absolutely never happen. What people do when they show up to class is they usually have like a whole pile where everyone throws their cases and then they walk to their sheet, their uh, seats with their band music and with their horn. And they just leave all their cases over there on the side. Um, but all these guys walk straight to their seats holding their cases and that is just really not the way that goes. <laughs> so next what happens is one of the guys that walks in the room is Tanner who is the normal drummer in the studio band. He's, he's kind of hot stuff, you know? And so he walks in and he, and he says to Andrew Neiman, the main character, the protagonist, he says, so are you the new alternate? And Andrew Neiman's like, yeah. Um, and, and then basically this drummer tells him to tune the drums to B flat and to turn his pages for him. Neither of which make any sense. This, I mean, you're in a conservatory, you know how to turn your own pages. This sounds like a middle school jazz band type of scenario, but we're in a, we're, it's, it's crazy. We're in a conservatory and you want somebody to turn your pages, that will get you laughed out of the room. But apparently not in this conservatory. Um, and I think part of that kind of comes with um, the director of this movie kind of recalled certain experiences from his own high school jazz band because he was a drummer in a high school jazz band and I think that several scenes in this movie are kind of shaped by that even though a high school is not the same thing as a music conservatory but I, I think he kind of takes that angle and that's probably why he um, included the detail about turning your pages but yeah the research just isn't there that's just poorly researched that, that just doesn't happen it's not the way it is um, it's just silly. And then also let's talk about the prior point, tune the drums to B flat. This is something I've hardly even ever heard of. I've never heard anybody to tell me to do it. I've never heard anybody doing it in like anywhere near modern day. I mean, this is an old, old thing that people used to do way back when I guess there was some pretty serious tonal issues um, that I don't really know anything about, but I have heard of this technique before. And so, so that's weird enough because it's, it's modern day. Why are we tuning the drums to B flat? And then when Andrew Neiman goes to tune the drums to B flat, he asks for a B flat from the piano and the piano gives it to him, which that makes sense. That's what you would do. You'd use the piano's tuning because the piano is supposed to be in tune and everyone would kind of tune based on the piano in the whole band. And so the drum tuning to B flat from the piano, he does this without hitting the drum. How are you supposed to tune something without hearing it? It's just tuning lugs around the side of a drum. It's not like the, it's not like a timpani where it'll tell you where B flat is on the thing. Um, he, it's just so 
like even people who would way back in the day tune their drums to B flat would have to hit the drum to be able to hear that it is in tune with B flat. This doesn't make any sense. So next, band practice starts, Fletcher walks in and everyone sits straight up and stands straight up like they're in a military or something. And, and I wonder if anybody who watching this movie believes that jazz band practice is anything like this. But anyway, um, basically throughout that scene, when everyone's like atten attentive and ready to start rehearsal when Fletcher walks in, the trumpets randomly like change order depending on what clip you're looking at. It's very, very weird. I don't know why the tr they uh, didn't just tell the trumpet guys to stand still. Um, makes no sense. Yeah, it's not like they were told to move. It was just silence. And then depending on which camera shot you're looking at, they're just in a different order. And, and then we get to the best part, man, of this scene uh, at the beginning of the song called Whiplash. Um, the piano is not at all playing anything like what you're hearing. And... So it's just one of those effortless things. There's just, who would believe that? I just don't understand who would, who would see that and think, oh yeah. Up next is a goofy scene where there's an out of tune player and uh, they're trying to basically identify him. And they look at the, uh, the low guy, the bass trombone player over here on the right side. And they look at him and they, they say that he's the out of tune player. And Oh, he kind of has a meltdown, but then basically he gets kicked out of the band. And I think it's really funny that his case is conveniently just sitting right next to the door as he's walking out. You know, that you can tell they planned this scene to go really smooth. His scene's just sitting in front of the door so he can pick it up and walk straight out the door. I thought that was funny. Um, I also thought it was really funny that whenever Fletcher was trying to find the out-of-tune player, he was really consumed, consumed with finding the out of tune player so when he counted off the song to listen to them play he didn't catch that all the times he counted it off everyone ignored his tempo completely and that is really weird because wouldn't a person like that who really cares about tempo like in the next scene of the movie wouldn't a person like that who cares that much about tempo because i'm sure everyone's seen the tempo scene and we're gonna talk about it the not my tempo scene um, a guy that cares about tempo that much would not let an entire band of people playing out of his tempo. There's no way he would let that slide. It doesn't make any sense. So they take a break in the middle of rehearsal and they say that when they come back, the new drummer is on uh, to play the song Whiplash. And you get this scene of him writing on the sheet and he writes these really random nonsense numbers that when you look at them, they don't make sense. It makes sense because people write markings on their music, but he's writing like two, three, two, two, three, two, or something like that above things that don't really relate to those numbers in any way. Like I've seen people write numbers like that. I don't really write. I, I mean, I write on my stuff and I take notes for me to help remember stuff. I don't personally do anything like quite like that exactly, but I have done other things. But this 232232 two, two, or whatever he wrote on his sheet, I looked at it and how it vertically aligned with what the, sh with the music that he was actually looking at and writing notes about. And it was just nonsense. Um, some of it wasn't even like connected with anything at all. It didn't even try to pretend to be connected to the music. It was just like him scribbling twos and threes. I thought that was pretty silly. Also, I don't want to spend too much time about it, but the whole Charlie Parker, Joe Jones story it just isn't true. So now when we come back um, to play Whiplash with Andrew Neiman as the drummer, there's a guitar player back there who wasn't there before. And that guitar player, whenever you watch this next scene about the whole not my tempo, because that's where we're at right now, when you watch that scene, you'll notice that the guitar player is only there when convenient because when a chair happens to get hurled at Andrew Neiman's head, the guitar player is mysteriously missing for that scene, I guess just so he doesn't get hit by the chair. Seems silly, but okay, let's talk about this whole not my tempo scene. It is wacko, it is hilarious, the drum acting in it. Um, and also, just when he says bar 17 and a four, and everyone comes in on beat one after he says five, six, seven. 
that's just so wrong. And also just the idea that that part of the music sounded exactly the same as when he counted off the downbeat of 18. So then he says, you're rushing. And th my response to that comment is, yeah, and so did the entire band. Um, almost like they played a track or something for the band. And the next time they try to play the whole Not My Tempo scene, he says, dragging, just a hair. When in fact, no, he rushed due to not subdividing. Then the next scene, he says, rushing. And my response to that is, yeah, I agree this time, but I'm not convinced you really know, Fletch. Then he says, dragging. Nope, he was rushing. And then a chair gets thrown and the guitar player is conveniently, conveniently not present for the hurling of the chair. Then Fletcher has him read tempo, which nobody reads tempo. What the heck is that? Um, and, and I'm pretty sure then um, he's asking um, Andrew Neiman what certain note values are on the page. And one of the things that he says is a dotted 16th note. And I'm pretty sure there is not a dotted 16th note in the song Whiplash, especially where they were pointing. I tried to look, and so I'm not going to be very definitive about that. But it doesn't seem like a dotted 16th note fits anywhere in the part of the song that they're talking about. So I thought that was really, really silly. Um, and then he asks him to play, or he asks him to sight read a certain part of the song, which doesn't make sense because sight reading is something that you've never read before. So sight reading would be the incorrect word to use in that instance. And then also when he sight read that part, he played like a 4-4 four, four dad, dad beat rock, like boo, boo, ba, boo, boo, ba. And why in the world is that in a 7-4 song like Whiplash? It's, it's like he's playing a completely different song and Fletcher didn't really say anything about it. And then there's the whole slapping thing, and it's all cute. And then he makes him have a single tear. Then, to cap this scene off, Fletcher ends up asking him if he was rushing or dragging. Andrew Neiman admits to rushing, and apparently Fletcher is satisfied with this answer, even though Fletcher himself accused him of both rushing and dragging. So shouldn't he have said it depended on the time that I was playing? I'm not sure what to do with a scene like this. He, that's A, the question, were you rushing or were you dragging, when he was doing both depending on the take in Fletcher's opinion, doesn't make any sense for Fletcher to ask, so the continuity is broken. And then the fact that Fletcher was satisfied with his answer, it's just all kind of a big mess. So after another um, scene of Miles Teller practicing in his practice it room with the whole Buddy Rich and the whole ding 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 la, 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 the whole blast beat nonsense, double time swing. But anyway, he's, I want to talk about something that he says when he's on a date with this girl that he asks out earlier in the movie, who says yes. And they go and they get some pizza in this place. And apparently, Andrew Neiman likes to go get pizza here because he likes the music. Um, I suppose he also rather enjoys the pizza, but Andrew Neiman's listening to the song after he makes the comment that he likes the music in the pizza place to the girl, and the girl's like, oh, okay, interesting, and then Andrew Neiman says exactly what the song is called, and I need to consult my notes for this. Um, he, Andrew Neiman says, when I wake, Jackie Hill, July 17th, 1938, Bob Ellison on the drums. Well, first of all, the song that they're listening to, the drumming is not significant at all. So I'm not sure why it would be interesting to point out who the drummer is. Also, I've never heard of Bob Ellis, so I did a Google search. Bob Ellis does not exist. <laughs> He's, there's, well, okay, there's people named Bob Ellis, but there's no famous jazz drummer named Bob Ellis. I don't understand the total lack of effort here. If you're gonna go about mentioning a name like Buddy Rich or a name like Charlie Parker, why not mention, you know, somebody else, some other classic jazz guy, Bix Beterbick or whatever you wanna say, you know? I, I just don't, I just don't get it, man. Like, why would you make up this whole 
thing. And I, and I guess most people aren't going to look it up. I just thought that was weird that Bob Ellis is not a real drummer. And that song is actually just made for the soundtrack of the movie to be played in the pizza um, shop that they're currently having a first date in. Also, I would like to point out that anybody who knows all of that information about a random jazz song that comes on the uh, stereo or speakers or whatever of a pizza station probably looks a bit more like this. And since Andrew Neiman doesn't look like this, I don't believe him. Also, one more thing about the date. Whenever they touched feet under the table, my ovaries literally exploded. That was hot. So I think I'm wanting to kind of rapid fire a few here. So earlier before the date, whenever he was drumming, he ended up bleeding and that ended up being a very sports movie like scene and it was kind of weird. Um, also, oh, let's see, what do we have here? Um, after the date, the band is playing and the trumpets are muted. You can hear that they're muted, but you cannot see that they're using a mute. So. Another one of those poorly researched, poorly acted, poorly, just everything, just not execution with the trumpets being muted. And then there's this part where basically he, Andrew Neiman loses the music folder. And yeah, it's, it's kind of silly. The other drummers really mad at him for it. And then Fletcher's talking to the two drummers about how Andrew Neiman lost the music folder. And the main guy, Tanner, is talking about how he needs the music to be able to play because he doesn't know the charts by heart, which is a weird way of saying people in a jazz band don't talk like that. I think I would probably say memorized. I've never really heard anyone in a jazz band say, I don't know the charts by heart. I don't have the charts memorized. It's pretty normal. Um, so I thought that was kind of weird. Um, yeah. And, and then once again, there's there's another one of those like make sure you turn the pages lines that's just so so odd and, and then before they go on stage fletcher tells the horns to sharp the ninth which is a very weird thing to tell a non-chord player including a horn which plays one note but you would t remind somebody to sharp the ninth if somebody who plays chords a lot consistently forgets but there's no reason that horn players should be even thinking about that. It, you know, it's just, it's just not what it is. They don't play chords. They're, they're not thinking ninths. They're reading the notes on the page. It's really quite silly. Okay. With regards to this movie, I think I, I have like one more major point to make. Um, cause I'm really not going to go through the whole movie. I've, I'm almost at the halfway point of the movie going through it right now. And it feels a little silly to continue because I could kind of sum up the last half of the movie with basically the point that I'm going to make now. Um, at this, at about this point in the movie, Andrew Neiman makes himself pretty annoying. And I basically end up hating the character and rooting against him for the entire movie. And when bad things happen to him um, in the latter half of the movie, I am happy about it because I don't care about his character anymore because there's this dinner scene, which is actually an interesting dinner scene in some ways, but also Andrew Neiman makes himself seem like a prideful little jerk. Also, earlier on in the movie, there's some other things that kind of lead to him being a prideful little jerk. Like there's a poster on his wall that says something to the effect of like, people who don't have any talent join a rock band, which I think is a pretty bad take. Like, but of course, someone who's like, I'm interested in jazz, of course, that type of person is going to have that hanging on their wall in their bedroom. So I thought that was weird. And then there's the breakup scene where he basically breaks up with this girl telling her that she's hindering him from pursuing greatness. And it's disgusting. So you, you know, in some other scenes, you basically end up, um, or at least I sure did, um, you end up kind of rooting against the guy. and. Yeah, it's pretty just strange. So yeah, without talking about the second half of the movie and spoiling the movie for those who haven't seen it, I think I'd kind of like to leave my criticism there. Although I, I do have material for the entire second half, um, you know, it's <laughs> it really does end up reading kind of like a script of the movie, just with critical comments in the margins. It really does, like my notes, they kind of look pretty much like that. Um, 
and it was it was a lot of fun to kind of come up with a list of specific things that made me cringe as I watched the movie. It took me definitely back to the first time I ever saw it many years ago. I'm not sure how old it is, actually. Probably like eight years old or something like that. I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, it took me back to the first time I watched it, and I was so completely just disappointed. And I, and I found almost every scene just unbearable in some way. Um, but yeah, so, so I'm pretty critical of this movie. Um, I didn't find it interesting or entertaining or anything. I found it actually rather disappointing because it was hyped up by so many people in my life telling me that I need to go and see this movie. Um, but yeah, let me know what y'all think. Um, and let me know what y'all think of my take. And um, yeah, I, I'm just kind of interested. So that is my video. Um,